With all the complexities, obstacles, and frustrations facing medical providers today, you still have peers out there getting things done and moving medicine forward. Who are they, and how are they doing it? Welcome to Peer Spectrum, the show where we uncover the creative solutions, innovative tools, and advanced practices of our peers throughout the full spectrum of healthcare. Here are your hosts, Keith Mencken and Colin Miller. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We're glad to have you. we got a great episode for you today. We have Michael Dermer joining us. You may have seen Michael in Forbes, MSNBC, or even your local bookstore. Michael is an entrepreneur, speaker, lawyer, and founder and author of The Lonely Entrepreneur. Years ago, Michael left a promising law firm as a M&A attorney in New York to start Incent One, the first company dedicated to providing incentives to move people towards better health decisions. Today, these incentive programs are much more commonplace. But when Michael started, they weren't. In fact, they were met with much resistance, but Michael was the first. He had to bootstrap it for years and even survive through the 2008 financial crisis that almost took his business and his family's investments with him. It's an amazing story. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Together with Michael, we explored the data and science behind moving patients towards better health decisions. We explored the parallels between being an entrepreneur and being a medical provider. You're going to learn more about Michael's strategies and tactics that helped him achieve success under overwhelming pressures and challenges. How did Michael, as a small underdog, go up against the largest in health insurance companies in the country who wanted nothing to do with him or his ideas? How did he get a win? We explored innovation in healthcare, how you can get involved, and where things are heading in the next five to 10 years. It was an amazing episode. We know you're going to enjoy it. We sure did. So without further delay, please welcome Michael Dermer. I literally stumbled upon the rewards business. Um, I came across a statistic that said, you know, for every 10 women that don't follow their prenatal care, it costs the healthcare system a million dollars. It was like, well, why wouldn't you just reward them? And that was, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurial ventures, just the beginning of the end, right? That was just one of those, um, you know, hey, this is an idea, let's business plan around it. I remember working, you know, in my law firm uh, till 10 o'clock at night and then sit around writing business plans. And, you know, left the comforts of that um, for a basement, you know, and myself and, uh, soon thereafter, one other guy and basically started just bootstrapping it. And, you know, at the time, you know, today rewards in healthcare are everywhere. Um, but at the time it was, it was like witchcraft, you know, basically asking the healthcare industry to pay the people that were doing the worst. Um, and so we were really the evangelists, you know, if you go back to the early to mid two thousands and built it up and built it up and, and, you know, really by the time 2008 came about, Um, we were really on a roll. You know, we had started it many, many years before that. So we had gotten the reputation as the company that really had, you know, talked about a solution that wasn't prevalent at the time, but now was really catching on. And we took a pretty big uh, slug of private equity, um, but we took it right in the middle of October 2008. So, you know, the day you're supposed to get your money and you celebrate a little bit, you take a couple of chips off the table and now you're going to really try to dominate the industry. Um, our business basically got cut in half in a matter of weeks. You guys remember that time? You know, it was it was crazy. So, you know that the next two years were crazy. Um, Twenty hour days. You know, basically waking up at five in the morning, working till ten or eleven at night, and doing it over and over again. Because you guys remember at that time, uh, there was just craziness in the world. Um, it wasn't. You know, the way I describe it is. When you now you kind of walk and you decide whether you're going to go left or right on the street. Back then, you didn't know if the street was going to be there. Um, And so those two years were just an experience of um, creativity, survival. You know, basically taking this this baby that we had built and trying to stabilize it and see what we can do with it. And fortunately, you know, we were able to plow through that and uh, a little bit while later sell it to a company called WellTalk, you know, healthcare technology company, Um, and it worked out great. Um, But it was a pretty life altering experience. You know, it's one thing to go through the entrepreneur experience, even when you don't have something like the financial crisis. Um, But, you know, add that on top of it uh, and you really learn, you know, what you and your team are made of over the course of time. But, you know, it's it's what I like to say is, you know, the the day before you sell your business, you're kind of an idiot. The next day you're the smartest guy in the world. So it turned out out terrific, but was a, a wild ride and quite a learning experience. Well, it's clearly it was totally formative for you, and um, I can't imagine that you'd ever want to go through that again. But uh, you 
took a lot away from it and it it seemed to get you to be even more dedicated to the entrepreneurial process. Uh, what kinds of things were you thinking when it was all said and done and you, you'd you sold it uh, about what it had taught you and, and why you wanted to stay in this field? You know, after I got bought, um, I had a typical founder's deal, you know, a year or two where we'd hang around the company that bought me and um, help integrate the companies and things like that. And the one thought I had in my head was, wow, you could really learn something from this. But I said, you know what? It, it's just our story. And I just, like you just said, I lived through it. I don't want to live through it again. It turned out great. Um, and then I started doing some entrepreneur coaching. And the one common theme amongst all the people that I was coaching um, was the struggle. And one of them said to me, being an entrepreneur is really lonely. Um, and that's what led to us launching The Lonely Entrepreneur. But it really was what you said is you, you learn that when you're under pressure, now our pressure might have been a little bit extreme because of the financial crisis, but you know, to an individual entrepreneur, it feels extreme to them as well. Um, and so what, what we really learned was that when you're under the pressure of being an entrepreneur, um, you develop these flawed perspectives. And unless you're able to change those perspectives, it's really hard to break through. So that really became a methodology um, that at first was just, hey, you know, I wonder if our story would be interesting to people. And what emerged was this idea that regardless of the business, when you're under this pressure, you really have to have the ability to change your perspective, have a chance to be uh, to be successful. That's what led me to, you know, the whole lonely entrepreneur. That's great. So um, the, everybody uh, talks about changing perspective, and obviously we change our perspective frequently. How did you recognize that you would change perspective. A lot of times when you're in the midst of the change, you have no idea that you've changed. Uh, was this a uh, sitting back and reflecting on it? Was this something you felt was going on at the time? You know, it's interesting. Um, because the financial crisis was so extreme, you knew you had to try approaches that weren't traditional approaches. So unlike your normal everyday entrepreneur who, who to your point, doesn't realize they need to change perspective even if they are, when you're in the middle of the financial crisis, if you said, for example, I'm going to go to a financial institution and ask for some more money. Well, financial institutions were going bankrupt left and right at the time. So you literally knew that the traditional solutions weren't going to work. And so you had to think about things completely differently. So we started to overtly say, how do you look at customers and investors and technology, you know, everything completely differently. So when we came out of that, we realized maybe not to the same extent, but that's exactly what entrepreneurs need to do is that when they're in the middle of it, right, and they don't know they need to do it, how could you actually help them do it? Because it's so hard to pull yourself out of it. I mean, one of the great examples for me is, you know, somebody said to me during that time, hey, Michael, you need to sleep more. And I gave the traditional entrepreneur's perspective, which is who has time to sleep. And then I, I fell asleep on the couch in my office for 30 minutes, like one afternoon at four o'clock, and I felt so much better. And just that's just an example of a perspective that you would never change on your own. And so in our case, we were forced to do it. But then after I had the clarity, after we sold the business and the pressure was off, I was like, that's the same thing that entrepreneurs go through. And how do you actually give them a method or a way of doing that? Michael, I'm glad you bring up sleep because it's something that's just so important, something we don't talk about enough. When I'm listening to your story, I see a lot of parallels to the path of becoming a physician. Medical school, residency, fellowship, they involve years of sacrifice now in hopes of a future payoff. And just like entrepreneurs, students and residents have erratic schedules and huge demands and pressure on their time. And the pressure is key because pressure from those around us can cause us to deprioritize things like sleep and other things that we know we need. In fact, cutting back on sleep can often be a level of dedication. Oh, I only need four hours of sleep. Well, I only need two. And Michael, you were the CEO, you were the boss, and yet you felt these pressures as well. If you're running a practice, or even if you're in medical school, how do you deal with these pressures around you, and how do you prioritize things like sleep that you know you need? You know, the, the, the first thing that you have to accept, and it's, it's really a brutal reality, is that even though you're the one that runs the show and sleeps the last and has your money in it and probably doesn't have a personal life, it's all it's all your fault, right? It's your unless you learn to change your perspective first, right? You're never going to evolve, and that's a really hard pill to swallow. But once you swallow it, you start to understand that, for example, when friends and family just say to you, "I ah, just just go on vacation for a week and you'll be good," and you go back to your desk and you're like, "What are you talking about? Like the marketing plan's not going to write itself." My 
So I think once you start to realize that and acknowledge that being under the pressure is not a normal state, <laughs> right? You're not making normal decisions. Um, once you recognize that, then the things that are going on around you don't seem so strange. Because remember, while my pressure came from a certain set of circumstances, most entrepreneurs, the pressure come from, I don't have all the resources, I don't have the money, I don't have all the people, I don't have all the capabilities. I mean, think about a physician's office, right? And all the changes under Obamacare. Now, all of a sudden, they have to understand EMRs, right? There's, there's pressure there. And the outside world doesn't understand that. But once you, under, once you kind of accept that the outside world isn't feeling what you're feeling and all the kind of constituents that you have to serve, then you, you really actually embrace it as becoming a better entrepreneur. How do I get better at this? No different than being a better uh, GP or a better surgeon, right? It's not like you come out of medical school, I would imagine, right? And you're great at it day one, right? You evolve and get better at it. So if you embrace the journey of an entrepreneur and, and saying, okay, I'm under pressure, how do I actually get better at it? instead of just, you know, continuing to bang my head against the wall. Um, I think that mentality actually helps you start to say, okay, how do I recognize that and do something about it? Right. Well, in medicine, a lot of the best uh, innovation comes from things like uh, trauma or not to, not to uh, minimize it during war. That's when a lot of the surgical techniques come. And that's when people are making decisions that are based on sleeplessness and desperate situations. But even during training, you are caught in a situation where you're, you're working longer than you think you're working uh, or than you think you should be working, and you have to make decisions when you're sleepy. And it's very difficult to, to step away from it and say, I need to rethink how things are going. This is a pressure situation, and therefore I need to make a different decision. Are there ways that you have developed or you recommend to, to really see when the pressure is building or do you just assume the pressure is always there in an entrepreneurial setting? Well, it's a little bit of a combination of both. Um, so it's pretty much always there, right? Um, even when you have people that run 500 person companies, it's just a different pressure, right? It's different than the individual person, you know, in their, in their living room who's, who's trying to start a business. But I think it's also important how to understand how to react to certain pressures. You know, we have a one of the perspectives in, the, in our methodology is about not evaluating your life in the middle of a fight. So what will happen is an entrepreneur will lose a deal or an investor won't happen or an employee will leave. And that's the very time they decide to evaluate whether they should be an entrepreneur or not. <laughs> right. You never evaluate like whether you want to be an entrepreneur when everything goes great. So it's part of it, the pressure's over there and part of recognizing what's happening, what's going on to you. I think what we're trying to do with The Lonely Entrepreneur is actually give people a structured methodology. So you can actually, you know, one of the problems that entrepreneurs face right now is they have this pressure, but there's an overwhelming amount of information for entrepreneurs. They don't know where to go and they don't have a structure to figure it out. So if you can say, hey, I know I'm feeling something about me raising money. I've never done it, I don't get it. At least we try to give you a methodology that says, you know, here's what you're feeling today. Here's the negative implications of that. And here's how you have to change. Because when that pressure comes, it's not like somebody hands you your entrepreneur card and says, here's the solutions to, to deal with. I'm sure it feels it may feel very much the same way when you're starting a you know, medical practice or going into disciplines in medicine that aren't, you know, aren't near and dear. Yeah, I think that's a really good point you made earlier about not stopping to evaluate your life right in the middle of a fight. Uh, if you're a third year resident, that's really not a good time, no matter what pressures you're feeling to stop and really think, is this what I should be doing with my life? You're pretty committed at that point. It's time to see it through. But let's take a look at a physician who's working in a group practice or is an employee of a hospital, and they're thinking long and hard about maybe going out on their own into solo practice. How do they know that they're not just feeling pressures at that moment, that they're evaluating their life in the middle of a fight? How do they know they're really ready to make this leap? And if you were advising them, what kind of methodology would you use and how would you assess their willingness or capability to become an entrepreneur? Well, I think especially if that change is involving becoming an entrepreneur, um, like many uh, skills, whether you're a, a technologist you're good in fashion, you're a heart surgeon. Those are very different than running and building a company. Um, and even though you have uh, capability, right, in those areas, um, a lot of times what happens to those individuals when they go and start their own businesses is they get overwhelmed by just all the other things that have to be done. You know, if you're a, a surgeon that's going to perform a procedure, you're probably not even paying attention to the office or the hospital, 
right? You're going in, you're getting in your operating room and you're going. Um, all, the, all that ecosystem around him is a business. And so I think one of the things that people have to be really honest with themselves about is, number one is, is the idea. You know, to me, you don't just go be an entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur, right? Normally, it's the idea that spurs you. You know, you gave the example of, you know, battlefield techniques that, that show up and all of a sudden there's ideas there. Um, the people that, that tend to have an idea that has value, then they can say, hey, I think this has merit. Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to learn? What do I need to know about myself? Um, there's others, and that gives you the best chance for success. There's others that say, I want to work for myself. I know I want to do it. For those individuals, or, or my career path is not the right career path, I don't want to take more control of my own destiny, um, then you're going on a journey. You're going on a journey to evaluate yourself, to supplement yourself with other skills that aren't yours, and then to actually look for your idea. You know, when I was a lawyer, I was looking for my idea, mm -hmm. right? And the one that I came across was not the first one that I came across. I think the ones that get in trouble are like, I want to be on the other side of the fence, the grass is greener. I haven't really thought about whether I'm up for it or whether I have the right idea to do it. I'll figure out when I get there, um, which is literally like dropping you in the middle of the desert without a, without a map. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the evaluation and part of determining whether you're an entrepreneur is going through the process of understanding both your idea as well as you know how capable you are. Right. You know, the interesting thing when I read your book is um, the things that the times when I shared what you were talking about myself personally were not with building my practice but with actually treating patients um, so I felt much more like I was the entrepreneur for a specific patient that's what I was losing sleep over that's what I felt the real pressure of um, it's interesting I think that doctors may just be um, have a lot of mini entrepreneurial um, events in their life and so yeah. Even if we don't make our own practice, even if we're in a big group, we have to uh, have the tools to deal with that pressure on a daily basis. It's really an interesting point. I hadn't thought about it. But if you think about somebody who's clinically sound is treating a patient, right? right? And yet what they also have to have is, you know, bedside manner, right? Yep. The ability to clearly communicate what might be complex clinical information. That is no different than someone who's in fashion and goes and le goes to leave and talk about their fashion brand and has to be able to clearly communicate what the business model is to an investor or right there's there's the clinical the technical skill you know whether it's clinical for a medical profession or or fashion and design but that's always in the context of kind of this bigger set of skills that you need to have the, the analogy a friend of mine likes to use is it's almost like if you walked in a restaurant and the only thing you were responsible for was the bourbon right but you aren't responsible for the staff and the food and the, that's a lot of times what happens to entrepreneurs. They go out there and say, I really know bourbon. And then they get out there and no different than saying I'm sitting in front of a patient and I know what the clinical diagnosis is, but how do I know, you know, what their health plan lets them do, how the other practitioners are going to treat them. If I have to refer them, you know, who knows where their medical records are, what their family is doing. Um, that's a lot of times what happens to entrepreneurs and, and, I don't know if this happens to doctors when it goes outside the clinic. That stuff gets overwhelming to entrepreneurs. It's not necessarily the technical skill. It's how it sits in the whole kind of set of skills. Right. Yeah, I think the issue is that we are trained in the technical skills, but the communicating skills and the logistic skills of, of managing care is sometimes beyond what our training is. Uh, and that's where we end up having the pressure and that's where we end up getting into these uh, situations where we feel like it's overwhelming. Well, we have a we have a section of the book we call like it or not, you have to be CEO. Right. And it's very much like that. You know, it's like somebody who goes out and has a skill, but they don't necessarily think of themselves the leader. It's, you know, the coder that would write code all night long, but they are the leader. And so in a lot of ways, like you said, if you're a, a physician, you've been taught clinically, but do you really understand the, the, the payment mechanism, especially with all the changes under Obamacare and all the other things that you mentioned? You're really CEO and whether you want it to be or not in order to be successful. Yeah, Michael, one of the areas of your book I found really key for me is the idea that you need to take a real assessment of what you're good at and what you're not. And I think for a lot of physicians coming out of training, they're now finding themselves as the attending. They need to show confidence. They don't want to let anyone know that they don't know something they're supposed to know. And 
it's very tempting to look at other fields like accounting and finance and say, well, that's not as hard as medicine. Just given enough time, I can master those skills and I can get that done in my practice as well. And it's really hard to admit that you might need a little help. And beyond that, it's hard to admit that that help might actually be more efficient for you and allow you to do your job better. You know, and this is just one of those examples of what we were talking about before in terms of change in perspective, right? It's exactly as you describe it. You come out, most entrepreneurs, I would imagine this of most accomplished physicians, right? They have a good amount of self-esteem. They have a good amount of confidence. They have a good amount of capability. And so it is not natural to say, I don't know things or I'm not good at things. And the day I know for me that I woke up and said, being an entrepreneur is an identity and being, you know, humble and being a learner, which, you know, I was an athlete m and guy. <laughs> Those aren't the first things, you know, a boy, right? Those are not the first things that jump off the page. The day that you do that and the day you actually embrace that as a strength, you really have an aha moment because then you just say, hey, I'm really good at the clinical stuff. How do I find the people around me right, that can supplement what I do? What happens if you don't is not only does the, does the business itself or the endeavor itself struggle, but you actually get more and more frustrated. If you're doing the things that you don't like or you're not good at, that's a lot of times what weighs people down personally. You know, you have a uh, take the coder. You hear stories of guys that will, and gals that will write code all night long, and they love it, right? But ask them to do something in accounting, right? And they want to jump off the building. So um, I think it's – I have a good friend who's a therapist. She has two PhDs and having a really successful practice, and she told me that she has no time – and just through conversation, she told me that she's spending 20 hours a month doing her accounting on Excel. And I was like, you're smarter than 98% of the people on the planet. Do you realize there's 100 free software packages that you can do your accounting in to save you those 20 hours? So part of it is the self-esteem and, the, and let's say the ego of accomplishment in one area. But part of it is also a lot of times people don't know. Right. They just don't know. Like think about a doc now that's asking to, to, to understand EMRs, right? So I think in a lot of ways, embracing what you don't know is a fundamental perspective that once you have that, then you just open up yourself to, because I would imagine the mental profession, there's lots and lots of individuals that have run practices. There's lots of practice management companies. There's even colleagues around the medical community that have run small offices that if you were the heart surgeon and reached out and said, I could, well, I could speak to one of those gals that ran a 20 person office and not be weighed down by that. But you do have to have, as you said, you've got to have that first aha moment of not, not resisting, but actually embracing what you don't know and what you're not good at. That's so true. Michael, let's shift gears here for a moment and take us back to your early days at Incent One. One of the biggest frustrations for our viewers today is, frankly, dealing with insurance companies. I was actually just talking with a neurosurgeon yesterday, and he was voicing his frustration in getting approvals for a procedure that he's been doing for a number of years, but keeps getting blocked on. And there's tremendous data showing not only is this a better outcome for his patients, but it's actually a cost savings for the insurance companies over the long run. And it's deeply frustrating to him that no one will listen to the science and at least consider the arguments being put out. But this scenario keeps playing out time and time again across the country, and what really excited me when I read your book was a story about how you went up against these huge mega corporations, these huge insurance companies, and you were the little guy, you were the underdog, but you got to win. Michael, take us back there to the early days and tell us how you did it. You know, it seems so counterintuitive now, right? And almost surreal because now people go, of course you have to have rewards and incentives to get people to do their health behavior. But at the time, um, they looked at us like we had three heads. Um, as I said before, you know, we're never going to pay the people who are doing the worst. And we said to them, well, wait a minute, as you just said, it's just math, right? Um, if you get pregnant women to follow their prenatal care, or you get di diabetics to do X and Y and Z, you know, it was, and yet it took the better part of a decade to get there. Um, here's what I would say. What entrepreneurs and myself lack are in the beginning capital and resources, you know, and distribution. But what you do have is, is some level of creativity. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, you have a way of thinking about things differently. And so I'll never forget um, one of the biggest health plans had gone through a, an RFP process, had selected us and had said, listen, we've decided to use you for our incentive vendor. There's just one catch. And we said, what's that? And they said, we're not going to pay you anything. <laughs> and we said, well, wait a minute, you're an X billion dollar insurance company and we're this little startup 
the amount of money we're talking to talk about here is minimal. And they're like, yeah, but you know, if you ever get in with us and it really works, you know, it's going to put you on the map. And now if I was healthcare and from healthcare, I might've just accepted that. But what you do have as an entrepreneur, you have the, the ability to look at things differently and you have to come up with ways to have leverage when actually you don't have any. So what we did is we went out and we said, what makes big insurance companies do something? And we found out it was the largest employers that they insured really had an influence on them. And so we went and we talked to the 25 largest employers of this insurance company and we said, hey, are you guys interested in incentives? And to a man, every one of them said yes. And so then we went back to this big health plan and said, listen, it's an honor to be selected, but we're going to have to pass. I mean, imagine that a young company being selected by one of the biggest companies in the world and saying, we're good, we're not going to do it. And they're like, what are you talking about? And we're like, listen, the money's small, right? Um, but the money's small to you and yet you don't want to pay it. And okay, no problem. And we said, but listen, if we ever come across one of your employers, we'd like to collaborate. And they went nuts. They're like, what are you talking about? You can't talk to our employers. And we said, all due respect, they're not like Federal Express is not your employer, right? It's and so what ended up happening is we ended up striking a pretty big deal, but there's always this imbalance of resources. You have to try to use your creativity to come up with some kind of leverage. Um, you guys know in healthcare, there's lots of things that make sense that never get implemented. Right. And so you have to figure out a way to align yourself to, to your customers' business objectives in a way that influences them, probably more than you should have to, especially when you're a young company. Um, once you get to be bigger, that gets easier, but you have to figure out a way, especially if you're coming up with something new and different, how do you influence them so it hits their bottom line? How do you influence them so it threatens their com their competitive position, right? And that's that's how you create the leverage to do it. But I would be lying if I told you that that idea just jumped off the page. You know, we had to think about it long, long and hard, how to make a big health plan do something. Yeah, that, that may well be the most important thing that we can learn from you as uh, in the healthcare profession that concept of leverage. We, um, unfortunately, are in a position where we rely on the hospitals for the space to practice, particularly surgeons, and we yeah. rely on the insurance companies for a lot of our payments. So we think, well, we don't have the leverage. But uh, there's a very good uh, discussion in your book about um, how to create leverage when there really isn't leverage there, or how to, how to look at the situation so you see that the leverage may be part of your creativity. And that's something that I don't know exactly what that would look like for the pro for providers, but eventually we're going to have to have that or else we're going to be driven out of business. Well, if you think about all the consolidation that's occurring and how the health plans are really putting the hammer to the provider community, um, you have to be able to try to bring some creativity. Now, obviously, what some of the provider community has now is consolidated on its end, right? So they're they're okay. bigger and larger, and so they have some negotiating leverage with, you know, with, with the health plans. Uh, I would say, however, that as you see more and more individuals going outside of taking insurance, right, they get into to practices and specialties that enable them to do this. The problem is that's only a small percentage of them, right? It's not the, it's not the main ones. I think eventually, you know, one of the great areas where you see that is, is general practitioners. You know, the, the primary care docs that everybody says is so critical to coordinating care and actually getting outcomes, which ultimately reimbursement will be tied to. And yet reimbursement has gone down precipitously, right, for primary care docs. So you do, you know, the thing about it is it doesn't just jump off the page all the time, right? It doesn't jump off the page that they're, that you're just going to say, okay, I've got this idea. I mean, that's where the creativity comes in. You know, a lot of primary care docs that I know are, are involved with the telehealth companies now, right? And so they take, they're not relying on their health plans as ultimately the the only source of revenue they have some private, they're doing telehealth and they're supplementing to the health plans. Um, but that's a great example. You have one one side of the coin that has lots of money, lots of capital, will probably do more M&A and consolidate. And you have an individual family practice, right? Um, you know, how do you go about doing it? Um, it does require creativity. It does require creativity. And in many cases, it requires exploring new areas that are unfamiliar. If we think about many of our viewers, they've dedicated years of their life to one specific area of medicine, and they've worked very hard to get very good at that. But there may be something that they see that could be done better. Maybe they see a new process, maybe a new invention, but this is how medicine moves forward. Michael, take us back to your pathway. As an attorney, you had a good job. You worked for a great law firm, 
And the idea of quitting all that and putting it aside for the high risk, low initial reward of trying to start up a company can seem pretty daunting for a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of parallels to being an attorney and to being a physician and thinking about striking it out on your own. Michael, take us back to your thought process when you decided to leave what is a very aspiring career for many people and take the bold and risky action of starting up a new company. You know, for me, it was a little easier because even when I went to law school, I had an old baseball coach of mine who was a Merck strategy guy. And he said, listen, Michael, you're going to run your own business someday. If you don't know exactly what you want to do, go play corporate lawyer for a couple of years and learn how money moves and deals get done. So I was really much more of a business guy. That being said, to your point, you're still dumb enough to make the leap to, you know, from a pretty high paying corporate job to, to doing your own thing. Because um, obviously there's some pretty, I don't want to say cushy, but some pretty easy, you know, pathways from being a corporate lawyer in New York City. For me, it was the idea. For me, the idea was so compelling um, that I thought that there would be great value created. In, and for me, it checked a lot of boxes. You know, it helped society. It could help really impact an economic issue like the healthcare system. Um, but I think for the individual, let's say a doctor that's been in practice for 15 years, um, if you have an idea or a thought, what you really have to be able to understand is what part of it you get and are good at and the part that you have to supplement. Right. So if you said, hey, I've got this really good idea for for developing a device. Right. What I would do is I wouldn't leave my job the next day and go develop that device. I would go find the people that play and live in that space. Right. Go find the people that raise money in that space. Find the people that have built businesses in that space. And that way you can learn a lot about it. And when you do make the leap you're jumping into a situation where either you're much more well-educated, you do it with other people that have some of the experiences that, that supplement you. Um, but making the leap, especially when you're a little bit older and you have family obligations, all that kind of thing, um, there is, especially because entrepreneurship is so much more prevalent now, to me, there's a learning experience along the way, right? Where you can actually get better at it while you do your other job. Um, and by the same token, there are opportunities to partner with corporate America in lots of ways. So let's say you're a physician and you've, you've come up with something you think could be a device. You know, at Cleveland Clinic, for example, they have a whole commercialization wing, right? That when somebody discovers something in the operating room, they push it up through a process. They've got funding partners and incubation partners that can do that. But even if you don't have something as formal as that, right? The large companies have what entrepreneurs lack, right? They have capital and distribution and resources. So you could take your idea, kind of walk across the street, you know, figuratively to a large company and go to their innovation and venture guys without having to make a leaf and build, build it on your own. In fact, I don't know if I ever told you this story, but when I first started my business, I went to American Express and I said, I'm about to build this rewards business from healthcare, but I shouldn't build it. You already have American Express rewards where you have the whole infrastructure to do this. The only difference is Instead of somebody getting paid or getting America's Best Reward points for buying shoes, they'll get it for getting a mammogram. It's just different data. And, you know, the brand part of it freaked them out a little bit. Um, but there are all alternatives for entrepreneurs that are not just a leap off the other side of the fence and figure it out. It's get better as an entrepreneur before you do it. And then also opportunities to partner with others, including corporate America, that, have, that can supplement what your, what your idea is. You see people who network and who build themselves as entrepreneurs for hire in some way. In your opinion, can you have someone else be the entrepreneur for you? I think that you can I think you can supplement with skills. I think one of the one of the disservices we've done in our society is we've we have focused on the idea and the passion and not necessarily supplementing that with the skills that bring the idea and passion to life. So, so like what we're trying to do with the lonely entrepreneurs is actually give people a methodology. Right. So I can actually do some of the things that we're talking about here today. It's okay. If you have passion and grit, you're good. Right. But if you run into that wall, it still hurts. Right. So, so I think that there are entrepreneur skills that can be supplemented by the individual that has the creativity and the vision, right? It's, it's, if you have the meds, I mean, think about the fashion brands, right? The fashion brands have these iconic visionaries that have the ability to see into the future about what 
people all over the world can wear, but they're terrible operators, mm -hmm. right? Because they're creative folks. So I think, I don't think you can actually be the entrepreneur because you have to have that passion and the vision, but you can definitely supplement that with the, the skill set, if you will, to be able to, to be able to have a better chance of success. It makes a lot of sense. Let's take a look back at Incent One again. One of the biggest concerns and something we get a lot of questions from our viewers on is how do I get better at convincing my patients to do what I know is in their best interest? It's one thing to know that a patient needs a total knee operation or needs to lower their blood pressure or needs to stop smoking. It's a whole different animal to convince them to do so. And it's something we spend a lot of time talking about on the show. But Michael, you have some unique insight into this because your entire business was focused on incentivizing patients to make better decisions. I'm just fascinated by this, and I can only imagine the kind of insights you were able to learn, not only on how to get patients to make better decisions, but what kind of things actually hold them back. What kind of insights and lessons can you share with our viewers as they work to get better at convincing their patients to make better decisions? You got to remember, I'm really biased because I started an incentive company. So <laughs> um, what I saw not being a healthcare guy was very obvious to me, was that if pregnant moms, for whatever reason, right, some of it was socioeconomic and geographic, but for the most part, if you had pregnant moms that weren't following, following their prenatal care, and then you start to go to things that are less urgent, like managing diabetes and, and nutrition and weight management and exercise, um, I was just convinced you couldn't. There's no question that people should on their own, right? They just don't. And so I became convinced very quickly that let's move beyond the should right? And let's just start to incentivize them. Let's figure out the right dollar amount that actually gets them to do something. Um, today, in the employer space, and largely in the health plan space, that's very accepted. They tried it for many years without incentives, and now they're, they're changing and have been changing, where most big employers are giving away $1,000 per employee per year to get them to do stuff. Um, when it comes down to the, to the practitioners, right? If you're accountable outcomes, and you're going to be reimbursed on value, right? It's really, really hard when that individual leaves your offices to say, don't eat donuts, go to the gym, take your cholesterol medicine, and I'm going to be reimbursed, right, based on how you do in six months based on your BMI, right? Um, so today, right, the tools don't exist to incentivize those patients. I believe eventually you will walk out of a hospital after hip surgery, and they won't just say, here's your care plan. They'll say, here's your care plan, and oh, by the way, you can earn two hundred fifty dollars in incentives, right? Right, because they know for everybody that gets re readmitted to the hospital, right, they're not going to get reimbursed for you know thousands and thousands of dollars. Before that becomes prep, so it's not, but it's not like individual practitioners today are putting money out of their own pocket to give away incentives to you know to patients. I think at some point, um, the EMR companies and the health plans themselves were actually, you know, we've been talking to a lot of people about those programs where they enable physicians to actually use incentives to drive patients. When you don't have that tool, I think you're at a big disadvantage. I think what you have to try to do is supplement it with engagement and relationship tools, right? So that's automatic schedulers, right? That, that's outbound calling and messaging. That's um, regular, you know, you have things like um, home medical devices and monitoring devices, right? You have things like uh, follow-up home visits. I mean, you really almost have to develop a personal relationship. Again, technology enabled, but a personal relationship. I I'm really biased. I think it's really hard to do. I mean, think about how many people that literally just come out of the a hospital after having their valve replaced and start eating donuts the next day. I mean, it it's, it's really, we know what we're supposed to do. Yes, there's a small portion of the population that doesn't. But for the most part, you kind of know the difference between a salad and pizza. And you know, <laughs> you know, a third of every prescription never gets filled, you know, one, one of every, I mean, so we kind of know what we're supposed to do. We just don't do it. So for docs today, I would be pushing for incentive capabilities from payers, but in the meantime, they've got to use technology to message and connect with the individual so that there's a relationship build it, built, right? That ultimately they can understand why, it, you know, why that relationship will help their health. Right. And that's very much the message that we carry as well, that, that um, it's the two-way street, that uh, you develop a, a relationship of trust with the patient. So it's almost a contract that you enter when you treat them. If I do a surgery, I'm going to do the surgery, but 
because you you respect me, you're going to do what I ask you to do to get better from the surgery. And it can't just be me throwing all my resources at you and then you just drifting off and eating donuts again. And I can tell you what what well-run practices have done. If they say, okay, $10,000 are as at risk, for example. I know my dad had shoulder surgery and the follow-up was incredibly coordinated. The right. physical therapists, I mean, they were not leaving it to the patient. Right. They were like, on Tuesday, somebody is going to show up and they're going to, sh- you know, not literally shove your medicine down your throat, do your physical therapy. And so the services that normally would be owned and managed by third parties, right, like physical therapy, were now being brought under the wing of the practices because they say that they're at risk or they have opportunity to get to get great reimbursement. So if you put incentives aside, I think there will be consolidation of services because ultimately you're on the hook. There's a lot of, of physicians and doctors who actually want to own that process. Right. And that'll suit the insurance companies too, because they're paying one fee instead of multiple fees to multiple people. Yep. But this is a great example of how our conversation dovetails because it's really asking physicians to be entrepreneurs, right? Even if they're right. not leaving, think about physicians saying, I'm going to acquire or launch these services. Right. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a big, it's an entrepreneurial leap for them. And even though they're not changing the the name on the shingle, right? Those are skills that, you know, it doesn't make any sense about why would I actually have um, physical therapists under my particular practice when I'm a general practitioner or if I'm a hip surgeon. Um, So it does require that entrepreneurism, even if somebody doesn't hang up their own new shingle. Michael, maybe your next book should be The Reluctant Entrepreneur, not The Lonely Entrepreneur. (laughs) I know plenty like that. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think think one of the things we've gotten a lot of feedback on, and the three of us have talked about this before, is We've gotten a lot of feedback on the lonely entrepreneur for medicine, the lonely entrepreneur for fashion, because even though some of the things we're talking about are general, there's a lot of things we're talking about here that are really very specific to physicians. I mean, think about the concept of this whole sense of self-esteem and ego about being accomplished and how that being very different. So once you recognize that and you understand you have to change your perspective, but they're very specific things that, like you said, aren't taught in taught in medical school. (laughs) Was there anything in your training, say in law school or in what you experienced in corporate law that you think really prepared you for the entrepreneurial challenge? I would say probably probably two things. Um, one is corporate M&A in New York, you know, huge company A buying huge company B is as intense as it gets. Right. So you're you're having meetings at three in the morning when you haven't slept in a week. Okay. So and that's normal. Right. And the meetings you're having is over billion dollar things that you know, you have a 200 page document that can't have a comma wrong in it. So the, the that pressure, you know, I, I worked a lot in my company. I might have been the only guy that worked less going from M&A to starting your own business. So <laughs> no, the pre- that kind of pressure definitely prepared me. I mean, don't get me wrong. The financial crisis still was another level because it was my my money, my people, my family, my investors. I think the other thing for me was being a, a corporate law guy was. I had, I had done deals and raised money. So some of the things that are hard, like corporate structure, financing, you know, financial matters, uh, raising money, you know, getting bought, that's like being on another planet. It'd be basically like me asking me to do knee surgery, right? Um, so that really helped me. The one thing I would encourage a lot of people to do, especially coming out of school, is get in some corporate environment. You know, when you just go right into an entrepreneurial venture, you just don't have a context. And, you know, lots of physicians would be more well prepared if they spent two years in a health plan, you know, because they would just understand the context. So people that go and work for, you know, consulting firms like Accenture, right, and they get formal training or they work in a finance office, whatever it is. But for me, um, the the intensity uh, and some of the things that came with being a corporate lawyer definitely, but it didn't definitely help me, but it didn't teach me anything about healthcare, right? So that was still the wild, wild west for me. And some still still say I'm in, unqualified to talk about it. So, Well, we're certainly, uh, anybody who's made it through medical school is at least prepared for the pressure aspects. Yeah, right? just, just take neurosurgery call and you're all set for that. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm really curious with your background in mergers and acquisitions. We all know there's a lot of this activity happening in the healthcare space right now. Everything from consolidation of healthcare systems, insurance companies, medical supply companies, and the trend seems to continue. What's your thoughts on the next five to ten years, and how do you see this affecting practitioners across the country? Yeah, I think it's the direction we're going for a long time. I think because of Obamacare and because of the pressure on 
medical cost less ratios at the health plan level, you know, and just basically limiting the amount of profit they can make. There's only really two ways in a big sense that impacts, you know, them making money for their shareholders, right? One is just consolidation, right? We're just going to manage more people. And secondly is managing our biggest costs. And when you look at their biggest costs, right, it's providers, pharmaceutical devices, medical device companies. So you're going to see the, the payers, which obviously they already have. I don't know if the, the government's going to let the mergers go through. But if you look at these massive mergers, I think that trend is not going anywhere soon because they can't operate independently. Um, they just can't make enough money because they're limited by medical cost ratios and a lot of the regulatory things going on. I think to combat that, you have the flip side on the provider and medical device side. You know, they've got to have scale to be able to compete, right? Not just financially, um, but also um, if you're asking an individual provider practice that has 20 providers in it um, to make the investments that it needs to make to be reimbursed, for example, based on outcomes, that's really a tall task. Right. I mean, it is not feasible for that practice to sit down and say, you know, let's put together a five-year strategic plan about the money we have to raise to put in place the technology we need. I mean, it's just, it's not realistic. And so what is realistic is they get consolidated. Um, they either get consolidated into large physician practices that then can bring the scale to have the leadership teams and the financial backing to be able to do those things, or they become like Kaiser, right? They get integrated into an integrated system and they become, you know, basically employees of the of the health system itself. So I don't think that that trend is going away anytime soon. Um, what you hope as there's still lots of innovation around that, right? Is you still have what the good news is there's more capital chasing innovation in healthcare than almost every any industry. So even though you have, you know, the bigger getting bigger and a little bit of too big to fail, I think you are you have a ton of capital chasing you know, what is essentially a, a, a problem that's, you know, one sixth of our economy. Um, but I do think the consolidation on both the payer side and the provider side is going to continue. I agree. I think one way to look at this, and Keith and I have talked about this in some of our past episodes, is that even if you are an employed physician, you are still an independent entity in many ways. Your reputation, your personal brand, who you are, will carry with you from place to place. And depending on who you are, you may be recruited to another hospital, but assuming this trend continues, give us your thoughts on establishing a personal brand for yourself. You've had experience in that, not only in your own company, but in what you do now. And tell us how important you think that is and, and how you get about starting that process. You know, if you when you start these days at a, at a PricewaterhouseCoopers or you know, PwC or an Accenture, it's one of the first things they tell those employees your job is to establish a personal brand for yourself. I mean, think about that. Um, I think when you have corporate America consolidating and, and offshoring things all the time, you can't rely on corporate America for your job. I mean, if you're just not reading the Wall Street Journal, if you are. And so what that means that part of that personal brand has to be that you control your own destiny, which means you have to develop skills. Part of those skills are entrepreneurial skills, right? You have to develop the types of skills that say, okay, how do I think differently? You know, entrepreneurism doesn't just have to be I go start my own business. It can just be the way you think about a problem differently, right? So um, if you understand that, hey, you have a job today as a, as a physician, but you're one phone call away from that practice being consolidated with another practice, you've got to establish your personal brand and your personal capabilities so you have the flexibility to do the different things that you want to do. Um, that is a journey that you have to embrace, you know, I'm talking about it in the context of entrepreneurism, but I'm sure in the clinical profession, you, you have to embrace it in terms of understanding uh, business models, understanding how the system works and just enhancing your brand. So you have the flexibility to move in different places in the economy. Right. I've seen that in a large group I was in, it made a big difference. Um, if a person called in and just said, I need a doctor, uh, I was in a pool of 16 people who may or may not get that patient. Whereas if they called in and said, I want to see Dr. Mankin, obviously that patient was directed to me. So um, that actually is very uh, true, uh, your point about the personal brand. Uh, when I was in the large group practice, 
uh, if people called in and said, I want to see a doctor, then I was one of 16 or 18 or 20 people who was eligible for that patient. Whereas if they called in with my name, I want to see Dr. Mankin, that patient would come to me. So the personal brand, even in a big uh, conglomerated sy system, is really important. And ultimately, that's our leverage, the fact that we're not just interchangeable cogs. So I think that that's where the entrepreneurship comes in, even if you're in a consolidated practice. Yeah. All right, well, we're getting close to our time here, so let's wrap it up with just a couple quick questions. Michael, something we like to ask all of our guests is to just take us through your typical day. And we know there's not always a typical day when you're an entrepreneur, just like being a healthcare provider, but just give us an idea of some of your daily habits and routines that have been very valuable to you, not only as an entrepreneur, but as a consultant today. Sure. And, you know, my days are pretty fun these days because I can spend most of my time helping entrepreneurs, which is great. Um, so for me, I'm a morning sweat guy. Um, I got those habits a long time ago, you know, kind of wake up, do something athletic, kind of beat yourself up in the gym and, and break a sweat. Um, one of the things that I do almost every day, and I think this is stuff that's in the Lonely Entrepreneur book, is I try to do the hardest thing first thing in the morning. Um, I really try to, you know, when your brain's humming, um, I really try to knock that out first thing in the morning. You try to write a strategic plan at seven o'clock at night. It's not, it's not that easy to do. Um, I also, uh, one thing I do throughout my day, which uh, is also in the book is I really do when you're focused on something, um, turn off your email and put your devices on the other side of the room. You know, you don't realize how hard it is for your brain to go in and out of you know, responding to email while you're doing other things. When you're focused on something, you know, these are just kind of habits that you that you do. Um, those are the things that really keep me going. And then I really try to, you know, we all have more to do than we have time. So I think it really is uh, making kind of notes for yourself to say, these are the five things I want to get done today. And And some days it could be two and some days it can be 10. Not spending so much time thinking about the hundred that you're not doing, right? Because that always exists. And what happens is when you think about the number 97, right, uh, you're, you're not doing number two and you're still not getting 97. It's like Apollo 13 when the spaceship crashes and somebody goes, what happens if these 23 things go wrong? And Tom Hanks's character says, listen, we have a thousand things to go. We need to go right run number seven. Work the problem. So those are the habits that I try to have, you know, kind of throughout the day, um, which whatever you're trying to do, make your day, make your day more efficient. I couldn't agree more. Well, just to sum it up, Michael, we've learned a lot about you today, and it's been a lot of fun. We're going to obviously put some things in the show notes, uh, links to your book, to your website, but give us an idea of how you're helping small businesses today, and how can people learn more about you? Well, our goal with The Lonely Entrepreneur is really to be the trusted brand that entrepreneurs turn to for solutions. You know, we've, we've been in the struggle. We think we know how to give people a structured way to, to become better at this. Um, and so, you know, obviously there's the Lonely Entrepreneur book. You can go to lonelyentrepreneur.com. We've got a whole bunch of coaching programs ranging from digital coaching to one-on-one -on -one coaching. But all this is around, you know, I was lucky enough to sell a company and I know what it's like to be under that pressure. Um, all this is around a mission. You know, if we can help entrepreneurs get better at it every single day, you know, that's what, you know, gets me up in the morning every day. Well, thanks, Michael. We sure enjoyed having you on today. We really enjoyed the conversation. I hope our viewers did as well. And again, this is Michael Dermer, founder of Incent One and author of The Lonely Entrepreneur. This is Colin Miller, Keith Mankin with Pure Spectrum. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for joining us on Pure Spectrum. We support the show by writing a review on iTunes and join the conversation at purespectrum.com. Keep up with the latest episodes and share your ideas with us on Twitter, Facebook, or email at peerspectrum.com. <laughs>